This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Deputy Sheriff turned author, speaker, and radio personality, Don Parker, on this edition of Conversations. Don Parker is one of Northwest Florida's most well-known personalities. For almost a quarter of a century, he has been one of the primary voices on Pensacola's oldest radio station, WCOA. Prior to his radio career, he was an Escambia County Deputy Sheriff. After retiring from the Sheriff's Office, he launched a career as a speaker and author. His books include, You're Under Arrest, I'm Not Kidding, Officer Needs Assistance, Again, and you have the right to remain silent. His clever and witty writing landed him on a couple of national television shows, including Good Morning America and Larry King Live. We welcome Don Parker to Conversations. Nice to be, uh, be have you with us. Indeed, whatever. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me about the transition from being a deputy sheriff to broadcast personality, author, speaker. Well, it, it took a few years to end up at WCOA, but when I chose to take an early retirement at the age of 42 with the Escambia County Sheriff's Department, <laughs> I'm 70 now, <laughs> I, um, I had, to, had, these feel, had this feeling that I would become rich and famous as a writer and a speaker, never realizing the terms are not necessarily synonymous. Right. In other words, one can be pretty well known and still starve to death, right. you know, and many a time I'm hitchhiking down the road, people would go by beeping the horn because they recognized <laughs> right. me, you know, but um, I, um, I wrote the first book while I was still a deputy. I retired as a captain in 89, and I was completely unprepared for the reception that a book about funny cop stories would get. And I remember vividly, uh, shortly after the book came out, uh, being awakened by the dispatcher at two o'clock one morning, uh, called me at home and said, um, Captain, um, uh, we, we've got all these people calling about your book. I said, what? Calling about what book? Well, it turned out that um, Bill Kazor, who used to be with the AP here, uh -huh. Associated Press, had done a feature on me. And uh, he had interviewed me a week or two prior to that and said, I don't know when this thing will run. Well, it turned out it was a slow news weekend and it ran like on a Saturday or something nationwide. And all of a sudden, the Sheriff's Department switchboard is flooded with calls from people who wanted the book, which was not yet out, you see. <laughs> and uh, the, the, I said, well, how many calls have you got? Thinking they must have gone, we have 38. Wow. <laughs> so, anyway, um, it was shortly thereafter that I decided that I would, uh, I would leave the Sheriff's Department and try it as a writer and a speaker. Uh, tell me about that first book. What was it about? You're talking about funny well, stories. The first right? one was You're Under Arrest, I'm Not Kidding. And um, I wrote that book as a result, really, of, uh, of a story involving uh, a little green lizard story. A uh, lady called the sheriff's department and said that she was being attacked by a baby alligator. It turned out to be a chameleon. And I drive out to their uh, crack of dawn one morning, and she's terrified. She's standing out there barefooted in a shorty pajama in February and won't go back in her trailer. So I wrote this little humorous uh, report and turned it in and somebody at the news journal going through the reports picked it up and published it well that caused all kinds of excitement it was a tongue-in-cheek about the attack of the baby alligator and all this and next thing you know don priest at wcoa is talking about it the news journal publishes a thing and and it goes kind of uh, regional the way those little funny human interest stories do nowadays it might be viral right you know. right viral yeah and yeah. uh that was what gave me the idea that people are interested in a side of law enforcement beyond death destruction high-speed chases and shootouts right what were some of the other stories in that first book well let's see in in the first book i covered uh the time that i helped the guy uh change a flat tire on his car uh, in a pouring down rainstorm at davis highway where the interstate crosses over and I'd seen this poor devil out there soaked to the skin. I pulled in behind him, turned my blue lights on, got out of the car, and uh, he seemed a little nervous, as some people do when the, the cops show up, but he was cooperative. We got the spare out. We put the, got the flat off, put the spare on, and uh, we got finished, and he offered to pay me. Well, of course, I said, no, I don't, I don't accept money for just doing my job. Right. And uh, he said, well, at least let me write the sheriff a nice letter. 
what's nothing wrong with that. So I reach in my pocket and give him one of my business cards. We shake hands. He drives off, and 30 minutes later, they put out a stolen bulletin on that car. So <laughs> <laughs> I helped a, um, helped a car thief change a tire is what that worked out to. Did the sheriff say anything to you about it afterwards? I didn't exactly admit that. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, it wasn't something I jumped on the radio and said, hey, guess what? I just helped this guy change the time. But I did feel a kind of a moral obligation to do something. So I said, um, headquarters, I saw that car headed north on Davis Highway about a half hour ago. Uh, with a spare tire. I didn't realize it. Yeah, it was a stolen car. So, and yeah. then the, in the next book, which one started bringing you some national fame? That really did it because that was the one that led me to Good Morning America and Larry King Live and so on. But the other two that, that followed, uh, Officer Needs Assistance, again, is the second one. And that was based, the cover illustration of that one uh, was based on a um, on an incident involving me as a uniformed deputy being invited to accompany the nasty looking narcotics people who were dressed up in their scruffy clothes and beards and long hair on a raid. They needed a uniform to make sure that the bad guys in the house knew that they were real cops, you know. Yeah. And so my job was going to be to actually do the initial entry, and I was just so excited. Uh, they kept me over after the shift was off, and so I'm sneaking up on the front porch. It's about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm told to bang on the front door and then kick the front door open. We've all seen that done, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So they're all around the house, and they give me this signal. I bang, 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 sheriff's department open. I kicked the front door as hard as I could. My foot went right through the plywood and hung <laughs> in the door and the door didn't open and you can hear toilets flushing and uh, they're all going nuts and the narcs finally broke in the back door and most of the evidence was gone and that was the last narcotics raid i was invited to <laughs> did to you attend. enjoy being a police officer oh it's great it was what? great it was so exciting and of course i'm glossing over some of the uh -huh. some of the uh the more exciting parts and some of the tragic parts too because right. that's the nature of law enforcement i right. I'd been an emergency medical technician and ambulance driver for several years prior to going in that. So my whole background was essentially emergency work before I went to the Sheriff's Department in 1970. Interesting. Now, what was the third book about? Uh, the third book was a, a basic continuation of the first two. Officer needs, I mean, you have the right to remain silent. And there's a picture of a dog with a newspaper in his mouth. And uh, that dog lived in Warrington, and uh, he would been adopted. He was a stray uh, as a full-grown dog by a very nice lady there, but he had a predilection for newspapers. He would show up with eight or ten newspapers back in the days when they used to throw newspapers right. regularly in driveways. Yeah. He would go around the neighborhood and gather up newspapers and take them home, drop them in the yard, and go back and get some more. And the, uh, the neighbors just went nuts over that. <laughs> and uh, this older gentleman, retired military, called and and said, this dog's stealing my newspapers. I'm going to shoot him if you don't stop him. And I told the lady, and she said, I can't stop him. I don't know what to do. I got a three-foot fence. He jumps right over the fence and gets the newspapers. And uh, we thought about it, and they were signing petitions and all that. So it turned out one of my buddies, a deputy, had a farm out of Molino there, and that's where he lived. And when I told him about it, he took the dog, and the dog lived another eight or ten years and did fine. There weren't any newspapers to steal out of Molino, and so I guess, we readopted him. I guess the dog was a real news hound. And no, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, well, do you still write? Uh, yeah, on occasion, sure. Uh, I haven't written any books lately. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, to write uh, bloggy sort of things, you know, uh, for the uh, entertainment and enjoyment of family members and that sort of thing. I think if you write or if you speak, you just do that. Right. I, I think singers sing and dancers dance and, and painters paint, you know, and right. I think writers write. I think we're driven to do that. I don't think we can help ourselves. You're a playwright, too. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've done a good number of plays. And, in fact, uh, before we went on there, we were talking with one of your employees here, your lighting guy, Mark Peterson, and I have been on the stage together. We did Harvey over uh, here at PJC, and he and I have collaborated on several things over the years, too. And I had one of my plays done by a workshop in New York, and wow. uh, it was called, it was called uh, Marcel Loves R.L., and amazingly enough, it was about a deputy sheriff who was running around with a waitress in a coffee shop. And I just kind of made that one up. Too, you know? <laughs> it was a two-person play. Interesting. Do you enjoy writing books or, or plays better? I don't care. You, don't just, care. you just like yeah, to write. I, address envelopes is fine with me, but okay. either one of them. Uh, writing is, to me, it's, it's the, the process itself is so pleasurable. It's just such an enjoyable thing, whether it's a letter or whether it's an article or 
or or whatever or even my bio because each time I've noticed that those those biographies get better and better they yeah. improve with age interesting well you're talking about the process if you're going to write a play or a book what is your process do you write every day does it are you structured well, let's or? focus on plays I've done a good number of plays <laughs> uh, many of which in fact PJC and UWF have done some of those over the years I tend to want to think of the story and I, I do much better when I have the ending in mind before I even start if I have that that sense of where I'm going with a with a with a story, um, I'm I feel more anchored as far as where I'm. It's when I'm halfway through and I don't know where it's going to end that I I tend to have troubles. Um, Neil Cobb, who is a local director with Pensacola Little Theater, and I have done seven or eight over the last uh, dozen years or so that we've done as dinner theaters. And uh, we've done, uh, one of ours was a Hamlet in a half hour, except it took 45 minutes, a takeoff on Hamlet. Right, right. Uh, we did one on, on Taming of the Shrew that we called Shrewd and so on. Now, obviously, those are adaptations. Uh, Mr. Shakespeare uh, right. did those originally, but right. uh, he can't spend three hours or four hours on the stage in a dinner theater, so we cut those down to, to a half hour. Do you enjoy acting? Not particularly. I don't think I'm a very good actor as such. I like performing, don't get me wrong. Whether it's this or being an MC or right or uh, on the radio, yeah, or I did you know a good number of years uh, doing banquet speeches and and so on, and I still do on occasion. I'm not as comfortable trying to be another character. I wanna I wanna break through, you know. I wanna be Don Parker. Hi, how you doing, mom? You know that <laughs> right. kind of stuff. I'm right. not as comfortable being a character. Uh, I think the really good actors can submerge themselves in a character far better than I can. I tend to be you know, the Johnny Carson sort of type that, uh, you know, when he's, he's playing Karnak or something like that, you never forget who he is. Right. And right. Uh, I can remember going up to my one of my former wives one time and saying, boy, did you see me? I, you know, I was, did this thing and I was really into it. She said, come on, you were Don Parker with the beard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you say former wives. I wouldn't bring this up, but you put it in your bio. Yeah. You, you've been to the altar a few times. I have. Um, I like to think of myself as a, uh, as a grizzled veteran of the marital wars, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm on I'm number four now, Okay. and uh, the late Luke McCoy, with whom I worked at WCOA, uh, was also experienced in that area. At one point, I think we had enough ex-wives to, to make up our own hockey team, at least. <laughs> Maybe even a softball team, I don't recall. But yes, I, uh, I, uh, they were all wonderful people. I love them very much, uh, and uh, my, my sympathy for them, why they would throw themselves away on somebody like me. But uh, I'm happily married now, and uh, we are in the process, my wife Kitty and I, living happily ever after. Good deal, good deal. What made you do it so many times? I mean, a lot of people might say after a couple, well, I'm done with that. Oh, I always enjoyed it. I, I've always liked m being married, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, did, uh, can't really say that the, the ex-wives did, mind you, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it was good for you, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably get the, get the impression that you and I have known each other a good number of years. Right. I yeah. do have a tendency to let my work get in the way sometimes, whatever that work is, whether it was law enforcement or whether it was uh, writing or, or uh, whether it was public speaking and so on. All right. Interesting. Talking about radio and Luke McCoy, how, how did you come about working at uh, WCOA? Well, I had been a professional speaker. After I left the Sheriff's Department, I went to work for a company called the Law Enforcement Television Network out of Dallas. And they are, a, a, in those days, a satellite law enforcement training network. It was just really getting going, that industry. And you subscribe, they put a satellite dish on your roof and so on. In fact, the Sheriff's Department subscribed to that show. And uh, they had read one of my books, somebody, one of the producers had, and I was invited to become one of their hosts. And that's what I did. I, I hosted a show called Star Points and did that for um, about 18 months. Then they decided they wanted everybody to move to Dallas, so I didn't want to do that. The book sales had begun to tail down. Um, I was traveling quite a bit as a speaker, which is uh, far more exhausting than it sounds mm -hmm. uh, as a professional speaker where you're going around the country talking at banquets and association meetings and so on. And um, Russ Minshew had passed away at WCOA. Uh, I never worked with him, but we went to high school together. Okay. And uh, there was an opening there, and I applied and did not get it. Um, I was interviewed by the then owner, Greg Gordon, but uh, he hired Marty White, far more experienced radio guy than I, to host Pensacola Speaks. Marty lasted about a month, 
and then left for greener pastures at WXBM. And Greg Gordon called me back and said, hey, that opening is available now if you want it. He said, we'll try you for two weeks. That was 25 years ago. So. Wow, well, wow. You enjoy radio? Yeah, I like radio. Yeah. I do. I, I like it just fine. I'm, I'm working under the inspired leadership of uh, Jim Sanborn now. Uh, he is my morning show partner and uh, the program director now at WCOA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he and I have been uh, working together for uh, about five years on the morning show. Luke and I worked together for 17 years. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. you mentioned Luke McCoy a few minutes ago, and of course anybody that's familiar with media in this area, and particularly radio, would know that name because he was, you know, he, he was he was pretty much a staple for the of, in this com broadcast community for a long, long time, and I think going back to the old days of WBSR radio right. and then latter years of he WCOA, did. and he was quite a character. What was it like he, working he for was. him? He um, was. Working with him. Yeah, mm. I, it, was, it was enjoyable. Luke and I knew each other before I came to WCOA, as many people did know him uh, as a broadcaster, but he was without doubt to me one of the most talented broadcasters that mm -hmm. I ever knew. He certainly had the ability to have made it on a national basis if he had had the burning in the belly, which apparently he did not. He was more or less content. He did some, he worked in Dallas, he worked in Cincinnati, I think, and here and there, but uh, he ended up staying for the bulk of his career right here in Pensacola. But uh, he had that wonderful voice. He had just absolutely superb delivery. Uh, he hosted Pensacola Speaks, our, our, which we're still on the air now. Rick Outson is the host of that on WCOA uh, for a good number of years, too. And he worked a split shift. He did the morning show with Don Priest and I and then came back in the afternoons and hosted Pensacola Speaks. And um, he suffered for his art on Pensacola Speaks. He yeah. was a man of great principle, right. and he believed firmly and uh, what he talked about, and uh, he'd get into arguments with his listeners and all of that sort of thing, but he was just just excellent as a broadcaster. Yeah, he really was. But you had some funny stories about him, huh? I do. Um, plenty of them. He, uh, he was a smoker, and uh, he would go out back during the during the breaks and uh, sit there and smoke, and I would often accompany him during the morning show. We had longer breaks in those days. Uh, it was a three-man show in those days, and and, uh, but he would brood over any type of criticism. He was the worst I ever saw at taking a compliment. I've never seen anybody that was worse at taking praise, but don't hesitate to. You follow me? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but by the same token, he didn't like criticism at all. And I can remember one time we were out there at back, and he's standing there smoking, and we had tried something that didn't work. And I said, well, I said, that, uh, that bit didn't work too well. And he just nodded. I guess about six months later, we were standing out there doing the same thing, and he looked at me and went, so uh, he didn't like the bit. And completely <laughs> threw me. I hadn't said anything about any bit. I said, what, what bit? He said, uh, <clears throat> the one about the school teacher. I said, are, are you talking about that comment I made about six months ago? And he just said, all right, you didn't like it. Oh, my gosh, that was <laughs> typical, typical of him. But he was also, he was great fun to work with. He had a mm -hmm. wonderful sense of humor in a dry, droll sort of way. But uh, he, was, he was a hard worker. I remember during um, Hurricane Aaron, I think, uh, we were stuck up there working six and six, you know, and uh, six on and six off right, because right. Uh, it was around the clock sort of thing. And... Uh, Luke had, and Don Priest too, the late Don Priest, had been known to occasionally, shall we say, um, imbibe. Uh, most of them kept a little stash in the desk, and we had been on the air for two <laughs> days on and off, and uh, we found a bottle of Crown Royal that uh, he had stashed there, and so we got a bottle, a couple of bottles of Sprite out of the machine, and we were helping ourselves. This is on the air now, and um, for some unknown reason, about halfway through the bottle, we decided that we would give updates about the storm, talking like Elmer Fudd. So we were saying things like, you have to be very, very careful out there because it's a very serious sort of situation with this storm now, even though that it's passed and so on. Well, some killjoy called up and complained to Don Priest, the news director, who came in during the break and chewed us out for not taking it seriously. And so he left and we waited till the commercial break was over and went back on the air. And Luke was the first one to speak and he said, I want to apologize. I'm very, very sorry all over what we said. We should be more serious now. So it's <laughs> <laughs> he was, you mentioned Don Priest. He was a great newsman, wasn't he? Oh, just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. No, none better. Yeah. Uh, Don Priest came here. He's from Massachusetts originally. Yeah. Uh, he was working in Sarasota with Mac Miller. Mac Miller 
the former owner, who was still alive, 101 or two years old oh, now. Wow. Wow. Uh, he was a Marine Corps pilot in World War II. And uh, he and Priest worked together at the station in Sarasota. When uh, Miller came up here, it was part of the ownership that bought WCOA, one of the times of, of ownership for him. Uh, he brought Don Priest up here as the news director in 1960, the same year I moved to Pensacola when I was 14. Wow. And Don Priest worked here for 41 more years. Uh -huh. I used to kid him about that. In fact, after we retired, I said, man, you were a failure. 41 years, six months, you know, three days or whatever it was, you never got promoted. And, and news, news director the whole time. That's right. That's right. But he was a, he was a great newsman. In, in, in your judgment, since you've been in the radio business, what's been the biggest change? Oh, but clearly the, t the technology. I mean, the computer, like it's revolutionized everything else. When I came to work at WCOA mm -hmm. in 1970, there were three computers in the whole building. Mm -hmm. Now, the market manager had one. Uh, I think the business manager had one. I think we had one back in the newsroom that we turned on occasionally. Nowadays, of course, I think just in the broadcast news area, there's three. And there's probably another four or five. There's probably 60 of them in the building. I've got a cell phone in my pocket just like you do, which is a miniature computer. Mm -hmm. My laptop is in the car uh, or tablet, whatever you have. And I think that's probably been the biggest thing. The ability to be able to access news sources almost instantly to be able to communicate through texting on your cell phone or emailing or anything like that. I think that's really revolutionized radio. But by the same token, it's been the downfall of radio to an extent because anybody can be on the air. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can put you on the air with your cell phone right now. You right. can have your little miniature radio show. Right. You can get your laptop hooked up, and you can broadcast to your neighbors or whoever mm -hmm. you want to, or talk to somebody in Tokyo, Japan. Mm -hmm. And that has, uh, in a sense, I think, fragmented radio more and more. It's becoming more and more specialized. Uh, when I was growing up, you had WBSR, WMBY, WCOA, uh, WMEZ, the country station, and that was about it. Nowadays, there's dozens of radio stations mm -hmm. uh, just in our own area here, and you have access worldwide to as many as you could possibly want, not even counting what satellite radio uh, can give you. Right. And, and the, the whole podcast thing is taking off, of, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so anybody can basically right. create one of those. Which brings me to the point of, you know, there seems to be fewer and fewer great per radio personalities There's so left. few of us. You're right. Yeah. It, it's so sad that, uh, that I'm the last of a dying breed. Yeah. Well, maybe not so much of a personality. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I I mean seriously. That, well, I mean, yeah, and there again, that goes back to the technology thing. Uh, many of the people that you hear on radio stations are working out of their uh, basement in uh, Boise, Idaho or something and doing it as a service for other radio stations. They're doing their own voice tracking and so on. Uh, but the idea of the purely local radio station with local personalities, there's fewer and fewer of those. COA is, is one of the few. Mm -hmm. uh, but back in the old days, you, uh, everybody had newscasts. Right, right, uh, right. You don't hear newscasts on, on music stations to speak of anymore. Yeah, yeah very rarely. And I, and I often have to wonder, too, is, is the the business has become so uh, geared towards big corporations. It seems like, in many cases, that the the community feel has gone away. I, you know, it I can rem has. remember the days where stations were involved in festivals and events. And you, you don't see as much of that anymore. You know, the the walls of COA right now are lined with pictures from the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s of various events and and uh -huh. uh, you know uh, bathtub races and wheelbarrow races and covering the golf tournaments and all of those. Sorts of things of it yeah you're right I don't yeah. think that there is and it, it's a question of money and it's a yeah. question of why isn't there more well it comes down to public demand uh, radio stations and TV stations depend on advertising revenue if uh, advertisers don't feel that that's the best way to spend their money well then revenue will suffer uh, as a result of that you'll see downsizings and so on yeah. Where do you think the business goes over the next decade? I, th I think more of the same. I think that you will see more and more, in a sense, uh, specialization and uh, more and more consolidation. I don't believe that the business itself is dead any more than I think print journalism will die as such. But look at where we are with newspapers nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would have thought that the Times picking one of the biggest com uh, papers in the country and one of the most respected would be down to, what, three days a week? Right, right. And uh, because why? Because there's a whole generation don't even bother to read newspapers, and mm -hmm. that's where it's going. Something else will replace that. I mean, there was a huge industry for buggy whips and uh, horse harnesses and so on, too, at one time. Right, well, right. when the automobile came along, that ended that. Times change. Yeah. What's the biggest news story that you've been a part of? Um, I would probably say Hurricane Ivan. 
mm -hmm. I think probably is the biggest single um, news event that lasted for uh, as long as it did. And uh, that, and then of course you have the, the spot news. I mean, uh, cases come to mind like the, the Billings murder, for instance, uh, where the couple was gunned down, which went on for days and days and so on, uh, other things like that. But uh, for us, I think the weather would uh, tend to be um, the, the big flood back uh, four or five years ago, the explosion at the county jail, uh, the booking and the detention uh, uh, annex and so on. Th those stories resonated and uh, made nationwide news. Yeah. As a law enforcement officer, what was the biggest case you covered? Biggest case that I had as a law enforcement officer, nothing jumps right out at me offhand, but I do recall um, one case when I was still pretty young, young in the service, so to speak. We had a jail escape, 24 or some odd inmates were able to escape from the jail by taking a correction officer hostage and getting the back door open and scattered themselves all over Escambia and Santa Rosa County. For two days, we chased these guys down. We got all but one or two, and I think those were eventually picked up as well. And that was Keystone cop stuff. I mean, yeah. all over the place, high-speed chases, following up rumors, went on for days. Uh. Uh, it was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes left here. What's, what's in your future? Uh, I hope radio. I just want to make it abundantly clear what a fine <coughs> company I work for and how much I enjoy being associated with them. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not interested in retiring anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, even at the advanced age of 70, I, yeah. I find uh, it's enjoyable to get up uh, every day at 2 o'clock in the morning when the alarm goes off uh, to be at work. Uh, I usually get to work around 3, 3.15 or so. And then we go on the air at five. Yeah. But uh, after all, what what is there to write? You sit on your butt, you talk into a microphone. It's not that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, how, how do you go about preparing for the show? Because, I mean, there, you, you're providing a lot of content day in and day out. Sure, sure. Well, uh, as it turns out, speaking of consolidation, we also prepare news for the Fort Walton station as well. And uh, just going to a variety of news sources, pulling up stories. A radio story is different than a newspaper story, which can go for columns. In radio, you really rarely have more than 30 seconds to get it said. So that means that whatever that story is has to be distilled down and put in in radio form. So you have a lead and it needs to come to an end pretty quickly. And you should be able to tell the story just like with a newspaper article in a sense in the first sentence. Uh, a uh, local man was uh, killed in a bad traffic accident on Highway 29 at uh, Hood Drive uh, last night, period. Mm -hmm. And that tells you what the story is, and then you can go on from there. But um, And then to be able to put news stories together. But by the same token, we do uh, news, sports, weather, traffic sort of thing. All of those elements are brought together, and then you have to be able to adjust on the fly. Real quick, in 30 seconds, another book in you? I'm sure there is. I, I don't know what that would be. Maybe it would be... Uh, Radio. It could be, yeah. I was thinking something along uh, Jeff Weeks as I knew him, something like that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That may not sell too many. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> anyway. Don, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Be Enjoyed it very much. You bet. Best of luck to you. Don Parker. And by the way, you can listen to him and his broadcast partner, Jim Sanborn, mornings on radio station 1370 WCOA. And by the way, you can see more of our conversations online, and we're also on YouTube and Facebook. You'll find us at wsre.org slash conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company. And by viewers like you. Thank you.